Redemption really can come from the most unlikely of places. After spending most of the year wading through the bloated, preachy, creatively bankrupt dregs of western cinema, Napoleon was my last big hope for a truly good movie to round out an otherwise crushingly depressing 2023. And when that film missed the mark in spectacular fashion, I was pretty much resigned to the fact that this is likely to go down as one of the worst years in entertainment since James Corden decided he could sing. To drop in for a drink at the drum. <laughs> then along came a low budget monster movie from Japan that politely introduced itself and said, Hey, fancy another Godzilla film? Not really, I thought to myself. After experiencing the cinematic equivalent of a massive child smashing their toys together for three entire movies, plus whatever the hell Skull Island was supposed to be, I was thoroughly monstered out by that point. But hey, it's December, so what else am I gonna watch? Aquaman 2? <laughs> So I sat down with my bucket of popcorn and my pint of rum and by golly, I haven't been this entertained since my granddad got his beard caught in the food blender. Yeah! Godzilla Minus One may just be my favourite film of the entire year, a perfect blend of serious and reflective character drama, potent war movie and gloriously destructive monster flick that manages to perfectly incorporate all three elements into a concise two hour runtime and does it all on a budget that's barely half of a single episode of She-Hulk. No 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 eat it up, go play okay three two one Wait 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 You know I'm the hottest you ain't never got a heat Godzilla minus one is a great example of a dedicated, passionate team of creatives managing to do a lot with very little, putting a refreshing new spin on a monster franchise that's had more installments than the MCU, and telling a story so universal that it resonates with Western audiences just as well as those in Japan. Hollywood studios could only dream about this level of creative efficiency. The movie begins in the dying days of World War II, Japan's now in full retreat and having to resort to kamikaze pilots to try to slow the American advance, one of which happens to be our main man, Koichi Shikishima. As it turns out though, Koichi's not too keen on the whole dying thing and instead lands his plane on a small island, claiming mechanical problems. Yeah, like, I totally wanted to blow myself up, but the plane just wouldn't cooperate. What can you do, eh? The mechanics aren't entirely convinced by his story, but before they can take it further, the base suddenly comes under attack from a giant dinosaur thing that the locals refer to as Godzilla. Koichi jumps into his plane to take it on, but freezes up and ends up getting knocked out while the rest of the base is destroyed. Damn, this guy fails so often he should be the head of Lucasfilm by now. Anyway, with the war finally over, Koichi returns home to Tokyo to find it in ruins and his parents dead. Bad times indeed. Plagued by survivor's guilt and shame for his failure to do his duty, he takes on the dangerous task of mine clearance in Tokyo Bay and eventually hooks up with a young woman named Noriko, becoming a provider to her and the orphan girl that she's been caring for. Three broken people in a broken country forming an unconventional family as they try to rebuild their lives. That's nice and all, but what about Godzilla, you ask? Well, American nuclear testing in the Pacific just so happens to hit him with a massive dose of radiation, turning him from a big angry dinosaur thing into an even bigger and angrier dinosaur thing. Before you know it, he's destroyed a bunch of American warships and he's headed for mainland Japan and the Americans are like, sorry lads, can't help you with this one, the Russians might get angry at us. Oh, come on! You know, I think the Russians would probably understand if a skyscraper sized lizard was on the loose, flattening cities and sinking entire naval fleets. It really seems like this would be a good opportunity to team up and take it down, but whatever. The point is, Godzilla's on his way to Japan and he needs to be stopped, so Koichi and his crew improvise a weapon out of their minesweeper and manage to damage him, but it's not enough to stop him and well, much carnage ensues before he finally gets bored and heads back out to sea. For now at least. The question now is how to stop him before he comes back and kills more innocent people. But will Koichi and his ragtag group of soldiers and scientists find a way to put him down for good, or will Japan face annihilation for a second time? The interesting thing about fictional monsters is that they usually reflect the deepest fears and concerns of the culture that invented them. Frankenstein was a reaction to the growing power of science and technology, allowing men to play god with life and death itself. Invasion of the Body Snatchers reflected the 1950s paranoia 
about communism infiltrating American society. And the 1954 Godzilla offered up a uniquely Japanese perspective on war and nuclear weapons, a country still very much haunted by the shadow of its past and the devastating aftermath of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. It was obviously very potent at the time, but it did make me wonder how well it would translate into 2023. I didn't have to worry though, because Koichi is very much the glue that holds Godzilla's story together, a disgraced soldier struggling with the guilt of not doing his duty, of surviving when his friends gave their lives for their country, of having to live in shame rather than die with honour. His story is pretty much emblematic of what Japan was going through at the time, and by taking the focus away from the specific issue of nuclear weapons and putting it more on the universal cost of war, I think it offers up a perfect balance between the old and the new. Koichi's story runs the full spectrum from shame and guilt to bravery, heroism and redemption. It's a movie about the importance of family, duty, self-sacrifice and finding a way to move on from failure and loss. Compare compelling themes like this to the bland, sterile, unengaging lumps of nothingness masquerading as human characters that we get over here and you begin to understand why western cinema is kind of fucked right now. And it's weird to be talking about this kind of stuff because compelling human drama isn't something I'd normally associate with a Godzilla movie where the humans are often reduced to screaming civilians getting squashed while Big Lizard goes. <laughs> or stodgy looking scientists delivering tedious exposition in dusty looking briefing rooms. Or this guy just staring off into the distance and wondering why he took on such a shitty role in the first place. But Godzilla Minus One cracks that magic formula of giving you a core group of interesting characters you're actually invested in, so that when Godzilla starts fucking things up, you genuinely care about whether or not they survive. This, my friends, is what we refer to as dramatic tension. All that being said, the monster scenes are still great fucking fun. There's a kind of epic destruction that you'd expect from a film like this, and plenty of ineffective military engagements with lots of big guns going boom. And good lord, this film may have the most devastatingly powerful atomic breath I've ever witnessed on screen. Also, I could be wrong here since I'm hardly an expert in Godzilla movies, but I think this might be one of the few examples to show Godzilla actually taking a lot of damage, compared to the older flicks where he just kind of shrugged off everything from artillery to rocket and missiles. The problem is that no matter how much they damage him, he just kind of regenerates like Wolverine in a matter of minutes. If I had to be super critical about the pacing, I'd say that the second half of the movie can drag slightly at times. Once Godzilla's made his first epic attack, there's a lot of planning and speculating about what to do next, and I feel like it could have done with getting trimmed down a little. The movie wants us to see him as a terrifying threat that has to be stopped at any cost, but if he's absent for so long that you begin to wonder if he'll ever show up again, the urgency of the situation starts to bleed away a little. I mentioned before that this movie was done on a budget of 15 million dollars, which is fucking mind-blowing when you consider what it actually manages to accomplish. Is it visually perfect? No, there's definitely moments where you can tell they had to compromise on the visuals, because even with the best will in the world, there's only so much you can do with 15 million. But these moments are few and far between, and honestly, I didn't really care because I was so invested in what was happening that I was more than happy to overlook a few visual shortcomings. Because here is a crazy fact, ladies and gentlemen of Hollywood, if you give your audience a compelling story with likeable characters, then you don't have to work so hard to distract them with flashy visuals because they don't need to be distracted. They're already having fun. Remember that? Remember when you were able to make good movies that didn't cost the GDP of a small African country? I certainly do, and if Godzilla Minus One is anything to go by, then so does Studio Toho. Anyway, that's all I've got for today. Go away now.